Hi, this slide is Hark to the Rule of 5 to 7, a variation on the last clip I just did. And, you know, no matter what I say, I can still hear people saying, yeah, but, you know, we're, we're, we're already doing that. I can't tell you how often I've said to uh, distributors, hey, you know, have you thought about doing that? Oh, we're already doing that. And they are, but on a scale from 1 to 10, where are they? Are they black belt fourth degree? They don't think that way. They just think, as long as I'm doing something, then I'm doing it. Like, I, it's like a, an 18 handicap golfer sort of say, hey, you know, you need to do this and this and this when you play golf. They say, well, I'm already doing that. And they're right. They have all the clubs in their bag that a top pro has. They have all the strokes and shots that a top pro has. They're just, you know, 5 to 50% less effective in every single shot, and it sort of adds up going around the, the course. So... We're here, we're talking about levels of the game as opposed to are you in the game. So I want everybody to say, good for you, you're great, you're customer centric, stop being offensive and open your minds. And first of all, answer all the questions on nichonomics that I'm raising in this particular segment. Then realize that when we mean to do things, we, we, we don't because we claim that we don't have the time and the resources to do something new. Uh, it's like new health habits. Uh, they last 15 days, at, you know, resolutions for the beginning of the year. Uh, we're too busy doing what we habitually do, and we feel locked in with our own self-imposed constraints. So if you went to a supplier and said, look, uh, Mr. Number One Most Profitable Supplier, I really don't want to reveal to you that you're the most profitable, but here is a whale curve for your line. And here are 20 items that are enormously profitable and very popular with a lot of my customers. And I want to do a special program where we beat these items up and I want you to give me co-op investing dollars. And they'll say, that's nice, Bruce, but here is the program we have to roll out this quarter and you know we want to ram it and jam it down your throat, we want to do it. And so you say, well, okay, I guess I'll do that. In other words, don't think that, that we're operating in a vacuum and we can make these things happen. If we say to sales reps, look, you need to call, you know, give up these little accounts and spend that time on the bigger accounts. And they'll say, well, I'm already spending as much time at the big accounts as they'll let me. Oh, but you need to spend different amounts of time with different people talking about different things. Well, can I just keep doing what I'm doing? Because I feel comfortable doing that. Uh, when it comes to operations and we say, all right, here are five target accounts and here are five, uh, you know, core profitable accounts. And the answer is yes, no matter what happens, the, the system and the processes won't change. Don't think that the average person is going to spontaneously think of service triage when, oh, um, I'm talking to a micro minnow customer that we're losing money on and will grow nowhere and the number two target account is on hold. I should just, in mid-sentence, cut the phone as though the phone cut out and take the other call and say, hey, number two, how are you? And get on with the show. Knowing the micro minnow will call me back. He's so lonely, he will. That You won't find that kind of spontaneous effect. People just keep doing what they're doing. Um, or sales policies. In 1988, after Walmart made... Uh, Procter & Gamble's whole consumable array of items work through their distribution centers, lights out, barcoded, and so forth, Sam Walton put out an edict. He said, we will see no more traditional territory reps who get paid 5% of everything sold in the state of Arkansas. These people are making 600000 to $6 million a year because we have central buying, and they're sitting in our waiting rooms with nothing to add. We only want to see uh, executives who understand supply chain economics are empowered to, you know, not only get it, but do stuff. We don't want to talk to any messenger boys. I cannot tell you how many rep organizations and manufacturers just said, well, no, you know, we don't care who you are. You're not going to tell us how to change our sales policies. Uh, another thing is when a big customer says, oh, by the way, I have an emergency and da, 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 da could you help me out? And we think, well, you know, that would, that's going to cost some extra time and money and resources. And you know what? That's not in the branch budget. And the branch manager is already losing money at the branch. He's under the gun. And you, we find out that if it's not in the budget, because all innovative opportunities aren't in the budget, you can't see the future and anticipate new, and you don't know what it's going to cost you. But sometimes you just have to say, here it is sitting in front of me. You know, I've got to go ahead and seize the opportunity and invest resources to, to land a, a big net present value whale. So... It's nice to say this, I'm customer centric, like, you know, it's like good health. We all believe in good health and wellness, but what is keeping us from doing it? So let's get in touch with these things because we have to if we're going to make it all happen. Thank you.